Hi guys and welcome to Nursing Leadership. This is chapter one and it is going to be over decision making, problem solving, critical thinking, and clinical reasoning. Decision making is an innermost leadership activity and part of the core of management. We will talk about decision making, problem solving, and critical thinking in this chapter. We can look at tools, techniques, and strategies for effective decision making. So let's get started here. Some people use the words decision making, problem solving, and critical thinking synonymously. So let's look at each of these and how they may differ. So when we talk about decision making, this is a complex cognitive process of choosing a particular course of action, the thought process of selecting a logical, logical choice from available options. This term implies that there are at least two options that have been presented as possibilities for action. At a minimum, the choices are act and don't act. Decision making, can, decision making can be triggered by a problem, but not often handled to eliminate the underlying problem. So for example, the nursing supervisor notices a staff nurse frequent absences over the last three months. Should she intervene or do you think you need more information in the decision making process? Would you be surprised to learn that you can improve your decision making through greater self-awareness? There is a higher potential for choosing the option that will serve the greatest good when you can identify how your values, beliefs, preferences, and tendencies show up in your thinking. This knowledge allows you to differentiate your bias from the facts. So let's go back to our absentee nurse. Yes, you dig in and you get more information that includes reliable information. You discover that the nurse is going to resign and return to school in another state. Now, will he or she intervene? Probably not yet. And why? Because the problem's no longer going to exist, right? So the supervisor decides that her time and energy is not warranted. Problem solving is the next one we'll talk about. And this is part of the decision making a systematic process focusing on analyzing a difficult situation involving higher order reasoning and evaluation. This term implies that something is wrong, or at least not right, and needs to be examined in order to determine the source and generate options from which a decision should be made. Problem solving includes critical thinking and decision making, but situations may call for critical thinking and decision making that do not require problem solving. If the nurse would continue to be absent and was staying at the facility, then the problem solving part of the decision would now come into play. Critical thinking or reflective thinking has a broader scope than decision making and problem solving. It refers to the process of making meaning of information through evaluation and judgment. Increase your critical thinking ability by questioning everything, especially initial, initial assumptions. It's imperative that nurses are critical thinkers. And I would hope that you've seen um, from day one of concepts class until where you are now, your critical thinking has very much um, come into play and you're much better critical thinking now um, than you were back then. Insight, intuition, empathy, and willingness to take action are all great characteristics of critical thinkers. These same components of critical thinking are necessary for decision making and also problem solving. And your book, Display 1-1, gives a lot more characteristics of critical thinkers. So I would suggest that you just look at those so that you know all of those characteristics that you would want really for yourself as a critical thinking as you move into the nursing world. When nurses integrate and apply different types of knowledge to weigh evidence, critically think about arguments and reflect on the processes used to arrive at a diagnosis. This is called clinical reasoning. Therefore, clinical reasoning is a collaborative and reflective process 
that involves content specific knowledge engagement of the patient and family in understanding the clinical problem and incorporating critical context contextual factors all of these factors lead to a deliberative decision making and sound clinical judgment decision decision making relies heavily on critical thinking and clinical reasoning skills we know that critical thinking and clinical reasoning do not come naturally we learn through life experiences through trial and error methods and learning how to reason insightfully from several perspectives Elastic thinking is a type of creative thinking. It differs from step-by-step -step thinking and arises from what scientists call bottom-up processes. This type of thinking hits the brain's emotional centers rather than the high-level executive centers. And this really allows us a different way of solving problems and making decisions. Marquise Houston developed this critical thinking model so that desired learner outcomes are achieved. This model comprises of four overlapping areas, each being essential for leadership and management. And you can see that these areas include didactic theory, that's our textbook and our classroom part, utilization of formalized problem solving and decision making, Using a small and large group discussion and projects helps build our critical thinking. And the final piece is making all material as real to the learner and personalized so that the material really sinks in. Decision making is one step in the problem solving process and it is an important task that relies heavily on critical thinking and clinical reasoning skills. So how do we become successful in problem solving and decision making? We look at case studies, simulation, and problem-based learning. And these are just some strategies that can vicariously improve problem solving and decision making. Case studies provide mock life experiences to learn from. These could be fictional or include real life events. Simulation allows learners to apply leadership and management theory, which can help provide decision-making thoughts based on priorities, timeliness of action, and patient outcomes. Problem-based learning promotes whole brain thinking and improved problem-solving skills, a meaning learners meet, discuss, and analyze real-life problems. And these are all part of just our experiential learning. Most people don't actually stop to think. They often take their first thought and they run with it. They rely on discrete, often unconscious processes known as heuristic to make decisions. Heuristic use trial and error methods or rule of thumb approach to problem solving rather than a set of rules. These thoughts provide a more immediate solution to the, to the decision at hand. Clinicians often turn to heuristics to look for general guiding principles to help alleviate the ambiguity of clinical diagnostics and decision making. These may be considered anchoring bias, where the initial source of information is used as an anchor for the basis of the decision. Unfortunately, the reduced ambiguity can lead to medical errors, inappropriate use of resources, and patient harm. So when we think about clinical reasoning, was it made by trial and error, or was it truly made by looking at your case studies, um, your um, simulations, and things like that? So let's talk a little bit about recognition prime decision model for intuitive decision making. So the recognition of familiar problems and the use of intuition to identify solutions is a focus of contemporary research on intuitive decision making research. Individuals act on first impulses if the imagined future does look acceptable. They blend intuition and analysis, but pattern recognition and experience guide decision makers when time is limited 
or systematic rational decision making is just not possible. And the last bullet point there is that they do attempt to understand how humans make relatively quick decisions without having to compare options. Besides some of the components we've already discussed, successful decision makers are also self-aware. They're very courageous, they're sensitive, they're energetic, and they can be very creative. If the situation is fairly routine, nurse leaders and managers can use a normative or prescriptive approach. Agency policy, standard procedures, and analytical tools can be applied to situations that are structured in which uh, options are known. Another strategy is satisficing. In this approach, the decision maker selects the solution that minimally meets the objective or standard for a decision. It allows for a quick decision and may be the most appropriate when time is an issue. Optimizing is a decision style in which the decision maker selects the option that is best based on an analysis of the pros and cons associated with each option. A better decision is more likely using this approach, although it does take longer to arrive at a decision. For example, a nursing student approaches uh, graduate is approaching graduation, aha, just like you guys, and is contemplating seeking employment in one of the three acute care hospitals located within a 40 mile radius of home. The choices are a medium size, not for profit community hospital a large corporate owned hospital and a county facility. A satisficing decision might result if the student nurse picked the hospital that offered a decent salary and benefit packet or the one closest to home. However, an optimizing decision is more likely to occur if the student nurse lists the pros and the cons of each acute care hospital being considered such as salary benefits opportunities for advancement, staff development, and mentorship programs. So definitely different types of decision making. And we all know that we make decisions really quickly um, all of the time. So knowing that there's just those different types of decision making that can occur. Scientific approach alone for problem solving or decision making does not ensure quality decision. Special attention must be paid to some critical elements. Clear goals and objectives must be made prior to the problem solving process, especially if the problem is complex. A decision made without clear objectives in mind or a decision that is inconsistent with one's philosophy will likely give a decision a poor quality outcome. Another critical element of decision making is gathering data. Information must be obtained accurately. Other critical elements in decision making include using an evidence based approach. Recognizing that evidence based practice needs to be implemented is imperative for all nurses today. Nurses are often putting human lives at risk and need to make decisions based on the evidence. Evidence based practice is also recognized as a standard expectation from the Joint Commission, as well as expectations for magnet status for hospital designation. Decision makers must generate numerous alternatives. The greater the number of alternatives that can be generated, the greater the chance that final decision will be sound. How do we increase our, alter our alternatives? We can ask others to help in the process but because we know that two brains are better than one. And we can brainstorm even if alternatives get off topic. This again increases the alternatives so that the decision can be successfully made. Errors that make poor decision also include faulty logic or crooked thinking. Faulty logic can occur in three different ways, overgeneralizing, affirming the consequences, and arguing from analogy. Overgeneralizing means that a broad language is used to evaluate people, events, or situations. So words like always, never, everybody, nobody. These can be very stereotypical statements that can be used to justify arguments and decisions. 
So for example, if you apply an interview for a job and you don't get the position, you overgeneralize by thinking you will never get a job, right? Affirming the consequences is illogical thinking that decides the if then meaning. If B is good, then A must not be good. An example would be something like, if the lamp is broken, then the room would be dark, inferring that the room is dark because the lamp is broken and eliminating other possibilities such as the lamp is unplugged or the lamp switch is off. And the last faulty thinking is arguing the analogy, meaning that one thinks if two things are similar, what is true of one is true of the other. So for example, in the book, it states that if we argue that because intuition plays a part in clinical and managerial nursing, then a great clinical nurse must also be a good nurse manager, which is not necessarily true because a skilled nurse manager may not necessarily possess the same skill set of a skilled nurse clinician. Other errors made in decision making include not assessing or ignoring the quality of the decision making that is required, lack of self-awareness, too much time spent identifying the problem, refusal to act, using outcome only for evaluation. So as a reminder, it's not enough to gather adequate information, think logically, select from alternatives, and be aware of the influence of one's values. In the final analysis, one must act. So when we're thinking about gathering data, what are some questions that should be asked when gathering data? We wanna remain impartial and not let any biases affect our data gathering, and that we don't let our own preferences or beliefs skew the facts. Questions to examine in data gathering are listed here and need to be asked in order to acquire adequate, appropriate, and accurate information that will lead to becoming an expert decision maker and problem solver. Lots of individual variables go into decision making, including gender, values, life experiences, individual experiences, and brain dominance. If we all use the same decision making or problem solving model and are all given the same information, will we all reach the same decision? I'll let you think about that, ponder on it for a second, and then ask yourself why or why not. New research suggests that gender plays a role in how individuals make decisions. Men and women have different structures and brain wiring. Men typically think more with their gray matter, where women think more with the white matter. The white matter may allow a woman's brain to work faster than a man's. And I'm not trying to knock you guys out there. I'm just saying that's what the research shows. So the white matter just makes that brain work a little bit faster. Ask yourself how much risk you are willing to take. A good example would include, you're applying for a new job, but are getting conflicting advice regarding whether your qualifications are appropriate for this particular job. Do you take the emotional and professional risk of applying and not getting it? Or do you take the risk for professional growth, regardless of whether you get the job or not? So I want you all to think, what is your risk quotient when you're making a decision? Another influence is right versus left brain thinking. Some individuals think systematically and often called analytical thinkers, where others may think more intuitively. Left brain thinkers are suggested to think analytically and process information differently than our right brained or creative intuitive thinkers. Left brain thinkers are better at processing language, logic, and numbers, where right brain thinkers excel in nonverbal ideation and creativity. When, as we continue to look at that right versus brain, left brain dominance, 
Um, we've already talked about heuristic thinkers, right? Most people don't actually stop to think. They just take that first thought and they run with it. Um, and we've talked about that, right? They use trial and error methods or that rule of thumb approach to problem solve rather than set a set of rules. That's because most individuals <clears throat> um, use that mental shortcut. They're not expected to provide perfect or optimal problem solving. And we've kind of talked about heuristic um, earlier when we were talking about those anchoring biases. So comparing um, economic and administrative man, managers that mimic the economic man uh, make decisions in a rational manner. Um, they have complete knowledge of problem or the situation. They consider all the alternatives. They have a systematic ordering of the alternatives and they select maximizing choices. Managers on the flip side that make decisions more like an administrative man um, and man we're using that because that's just the name of the different types. Um, knowledge is fragmented. It's impossible to accurately predict future consequences. Consider multiple alternatives, but not all of the alternatives. They make decisions that are good enough and the final choice is satisfying. So you can see the difference in when you compare the economic man to the administrative man. <clears throat> so as a reminder, to make better decisions, we need to use a systematic decision-making process whenever possible. A structured approach to problem solving and decision-making increases clinical reasoning and creates a way to learn how to make quality decisions because it eliminates trial and error and focuses on proven processes. A popular model for problem solving is the traditional problem solving process. As you can see in step two, information is gathered to identify any barriers and inefficiencies. And then in step five, a decision occurs to prevent the decision makers from getting sidetracked. The biggest downfall with the traditional problem solving process is it is less effective when there are time constraints. So the title of this slide should look very familiar for, we, for you. So we know the nursing process is a solving problem and decision making model. So let's go back to our original absentee nurse. When we put the nursing process in place for this situation, we can assess Right, we're going to collect the data about the situation, including subjective and objective data from a reliable source. We're going to diagnose or analyze that data. So we're going to form an educated judgment about the situation or problem and determine if it warrants any action. The plan part of the nursing process allows us to identify criteria for the de decision and any alternative solutions. This is where our decision-making tools or models help us choose the best solution. Implementing helps us put, an, put alter, alternate options in place and test them out. And then we're gonna evaluate. And this really helps us to determine if the correct decision was made. Did the outcome align with the original objective? Our evidence-based practice is based on research and science. It continually is updating. So what may have been best practice 15 or even five years ago has been updated and is no longer best practice. That's why when we are doing research, we should be looking for the most recent practice standards. So how do new nurses strategize to promote evidence-based practice? We implement and evaluate nationally sanctioned clinical practice guidelines. We question and challenge nursing traditions and promote a spirit of risk taking. You're going to come across units, nurses um, that are kind of set in their ways, right? Question and challenge some of those traditions. Dispel myths and traditions that aren't supported by the evidence. Collaborate with other nurses locally and even globally, and interact with other disciplines to bring, to bring nursing evidence to the table. Tools have been developed to help provide order and direction and obtaining and using information 
or helpful in selecting who should be involved in making the decision. A decision grid allows one to visually examine the alternatives and compare each against the same criteria. Most decision grids have very few options and criteria. Payoff tables have a cost profit volume relationship and are good for quantitative data. A decision tree is another visual aid that can evaluate your alternatives and are created and tied to outcomes of other events for analysis. The decision tree on the slide depicts hiring temporary or permanent staff and the impact that would have. Consequence tables help us to see how alternatives create different consequences. Logic models are schematics or pictures of how programs are intended to operate. The schematic typically includes resources, processes, and desired outcomes, and depicts exactly what the relationships are between the three components. Consequence tables are the perfect marriage between decision grids and decision trees. The goal of this decision-making tool is to rate how well the alternatives meet the objectives by plotting the consequence of implementing the option like you do with a decision tree. And the last one there is program evaluation and review technique or PERT, which helps to determine the timing of the decision. We are looking at the events, activities, and, and they need to fall into place before the final event can occur. These are all decision-making tools that you can utilize as you're coming to a final decision. And that concludes chapter one. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.